6-1 Estimating with Finite Sums Distance Travel We know why a mathematician pondering motion problems might have been led to consider slopes of curves, but what do those same motion problems have to do with areas under the curves? Consider the following problem from a typical elementary school textbook. A train moves along a track at a steady rate of 75 miles per hour from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. What is the total distance traveled by the train? Well, we can turn the 75 into a function, so we have y equals 75, and we graph y equals 75. Now, if we're looking from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, as the time, then the area under the curve represents the distance traveled. So this area is actually distance, because when we multiply the base times the height, we'll have 2 times 75, which is 150, but let's look at the labels. We have miles per hour, let's write it like this, miles per hour, and we're multiplying that times the time, which uh, is hours. Now the hours will cancel and we're left with 150 miles. Now that's fairly straightforward to do because it's a nice rectangle and we know the area of rectangles, but what if we had, what if the, the train uh, sped up, keeps, kept speeding up, and then the train slowed down? Could we still calculate the distance traveled? Well, sure we could. We could just break this up into known areas. And the known areas we look at are rectangles. So we could break this up into a bunch of rectangles, add up the rectangles, and uh, find the area under the curve, which would be the distance that the train traveled. But there'd be a little bit of error in this, because if we use rectangles and this thing is curving, there's going to be some missing area. But we could still estimate the value. Would the area of this irregular region still give the total distance traveled over the time interval? Sure. Newton and Leibniz, and actually many others who had considered this question, thought that it obviously would. And that is why they were interested in a calculus for finding areas under curves. They imagined the time interval being partitioned into many tiny subintervals, each one so small that the velocity over it would essentially be constant. Geometrically, this was equivalent to slicing the irregular region into narrow strips, each of which would be nearly indistinguishable from a narrow rectangle. In other words, they could take this area and cut it up into tiny, tiny, tiny little rectangles. They argued that, just as the total area could be found by summing the areas of the essentially rectangular strips, the total distance traveled could be found by summing the small distances traveled over the tiny time intervals. So to get the entire interval, they could just add up tiny little time intervals. In other words, uh, narrow little rectangles. Example 1. Finding distance traveled when velocity varies. A particle starts at x equals 0 and moves along the x-axis with velocity v of t equals t squared. Now, it's not a constant. Uh, the, the velocity is going to vary. For time t greater than or equal to 0, where is the particle at t equals 3? We're going to take t squared, which is, uh, here's the parabola. We're going to go from 0 to 3, and we're going to cut it into three subintervals. Now we're going to have three partitions using LRAM, which is left rectangular approximation method. So here's the first base of the rectangle. Here's our first rectangle from 0 to 1. Now we're going to raise this rectangle until the left side touches the curve, and this one already touches. So this has an area of 0. Then here's the base of our second rectangle, and we're going to raise that rectangle up until the left side hits the curve. Then our third rectangle, we're going to raise this up until the left side hits the curve, so about right there, and there shouldn't be a, a gap in there. All right, so now we have three rectangles. The first one is a 1 by 0. Then we're going to add that to a 1 by 1. And this value is 1 because f of 1 is 1 squared, which is 1. And then we have plus, uh, the base of this one is 1, and that's going to be times f of 2, and in this case that's 4. So 0 squared is 0, 1 squared gives me the height, which is 2, and 2 squared gives me 4. So we have a 0 plus 1 plus 4, and the answer is 5. The approximation is 5. Now this is definitely going to be an underestimate because uh, look at all this gap, these huge gaps of missing area. Now with an increasing function, increasing, and LRAM, 
that combines to give an underestimate. Now let's look at uh, MRAM, mid rectangular approximation method or midpoint. Let's get, I'm going to get the rectangular tool, the rectangle tool that I have. And uh, the first rectangle has a width of 1, but we're going to raise that until the curve hits the middle of the rectangle. Then here's the base of the second rectangle, and we'll raise that until the middle hits uh, the curve. And then on the third one, we'll raise it until the curve is going through the middle, about right there. We still have three rectangles, and the width is still one. So we have a one by, now the height is going to be f of one half, or in other words, 0.5, plus the base is one for this one, by f of one and a half or three halves, and then plus one by f of uh, 2.5, which is uh, five halves. Now remember the function is t squared, and the ones really aren't going to affect the problem, so we have one fourth, that's one half squared, plus nine fourths, and then plus 25 fourths. So 10 looks like 35 fourths. So the estimate for this one is uh, 8 and 3 fourths. Now this one's an overestimate. Actually, we don't know. I take that back. This one, uh, we're not really sure because we have some extra area and we have some missing area. So on MRAM, it's just it's kind of hard to tell whether it's an over or an underestimate. On the third one, we have uh, RRAM. So we have right rectangular approximation method. And we're still ha we still have three partitions. So here's the first rectangle. Here's the base. And we'll raise this one up until the right side of the rectangle hits the curve. And then we'll keep doing the same thing. So here's the base of the second rectangle. And on the third one, here's the base. It's one. And then we'll raise this up until the right side hits, which will be all the way up to the top there. Well, now the formula, or, or the area under the curve, and you can see this is a big time overestimate. Uh, each base is 1 by, now we're going to do f of 1, plus 1 by f of 2, and then plus 1 by f of 3. And f of 1, remember, we're squaring, so it's 1 plus, this is f of 2, 4 plus 9. So this is 14, so we have an estimate of 14. But with an increasing function in RAM, it's definitely going to be an overestimate. Now notice on when I have LRAM, this zero is a strictly a left endpoint. So we didn't use f of three. We used f of two and stopped. With RAM, this three is strictly a right endpoint, and zero is strictly a left endpoint. So we didn't use zero on this one. We started with one, and then two, and then three. And that'll be important for the assignment. How about uh, six partitions? So we're going to go from zero to three with six partitions. So let's grab the rectangle tool, and let's get the rectangles. And now instead of the base being one, the base is a half and we're using L. So this first one is 0. Then we'll raise the next one up just a little bit. Next one is a base of a half. Another half would be right here. Raise it up to the left side, hits the curve. Left side hits the curve, and on the last one, the left side hits the curve. So this should be six rectangles. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now each of the bases are a half. So we have one half times f of 0 plus 1 half times f of 0.5 or 1 half plus 1 half times f of 1 plus 1 half times f of 1 and a half which is 3 halves plus 1 half times f of we have 3 halves plus 2 so there's 1 2 3 4 5 rectangles and then finally, the last one, the height, is f of 2.5. So we have plus 1 half times f of, and 2 and a half is 5 halves. Now the function is t squared, so we're going to square all of these function values. We have 1 half plus 1 half times 1 fourth, plus 1 half times 1, plus 1 half times 9 fourths, 
plus one half times four plus one half times 25 fourths. Now we have four eighths plus one eighth plus another half, that's four eighths, plus we have nine eighths plus, this will be two, uh, which will be 16 eighths, and then plus 25 eighths. So four, five, nine, 18, uh, 34, 34, and 25 is 59. So we have 59 eighths. Graph the region defined by the graph of f of x equals 4x minus x squared and the x-axis from 0 to 4. Let's partition 0 to 4 into 4 subintervals and show the 4 rectangles that LRAM uses to approximate the area of R. All right, let's, uh, let's get the rectangular tool. And there's the, uh, the graph of that upside-down parabola. And we're doing LRAM, so here's the first rectangle. It has an area of 0. And then we have the second rectangle. It has a base of 1 because we're partitioning this into four pieces. And there's the left side. Now we'll raise this one up, base of 1. Raise that up until the left side hits the curve. And then here's the last one. So there's the base. We'll raise that up till it hits the curve. So there's the four rectangles, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, and then we'll calculate the area by hand. Uh, and then here's the function, so each base is 1, so I can factor out a 1. I'll need f of 0 plus f of 1 plus f of 2 and then plus f of 3. Now since we're using LRAM, 0 is strictly a left endpoint and 4 is strictly a right endpoint, so we're not actually going to use 4. We'll use 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now if this was our RAM, I would use 1, 2, 3, and 4. Well, we got to plug these values in. So we have uh, 1 times f of 0 would be 0 plus 4 minus 1 is 3. 8 minus 4 is 4. And when I plug 3 in, I get 12 minus 9 is 3. So the approximation is 10. Calculate the same value using the RAM program. So I'm going to get a calculator out. Here's a calculator. And uh, we're going to calculate the same value using the RAM program. So we go to program, and we have the RAM program. Uh, well, first of all, we have to put uh, the equation into y1. If we don't do that, uh, it's not going to get an answer for us. So we have 4x minus x squared. That's the first step. And now I can quit out of here and run the program. So we have program. I go to RAM. Run the program. The a is 0 in this case. The b is 4. And I want four subintervals. And we can see that LRAM gives us a value of 10. Well, now it says uh, run the calculator for 10, 50, 100, and 500 subintervals. So let's do that. And I'm going to edit this out because it, it takes a while for the calculator to process. And I don't want you uh, just sitting here watching this calculator run. So away we go. Program, RAM. We're going from 0 to 4. And now we want 10 subintervals. And we can see left is 10.56, mid is 10.72, right is 10.56. You can see they're starting to converge to the same value. We can run the program again for 50, so 0 to 4 with 50 subintervals. 10.662, 10.668, 10.662. They're getting, they're converging even closer. Let's run the program for 100 subintervals. Whoops, and that's not what I want. I want to delete this out. We're going from 0 to 4 with 100 subintervals. You can see now 10.66, 10.66, 10.66 with 100. And if we do this for 500, I'm sure that those values will be very close uh, together. So we have 0 to 4 with 500 subintervals. And this will take a while. 
And through the magic of editing, it looks instantaneous, but look, 10.6666, lots of sixes, that's two-thirds, really. So the answer seems to be an area of 10 and two-thirds. Estimating the volume of a sphere. Estimate the volume of a solid sphere of radius 4. Well, notice how we can take a circle and rotate the circle around the x-axis. Then we can cut that sphere, or estimate the volume by using cylinders. And we know the volume of a cylinder. The volume is pi r squared h. And notice how the radius of all of these cylinders is following the circle. So it's following the circle, all the radii. So the radius is the equation of the circle. So we have volume equals pi times. We have the square root of 16 minus x squared squared times h. Now that's going to cancel out, so we have pi times 16 minus x squared times h. But built into our RAM program, if we say we're going from negative 4 to 4 with a hundred subintervals, it's going to know what the h is. So we're going to go into our calculator into y equals and we're going to type in pi, that's e, let's try pi, pi times the square root of 16 minus x squared and we don't need the h because the formula in the program is going to calculate the h for us so we're going to quit and now in the program we're going from negative 4 to 4, and let's say we have 100 cylinders. So the volume of the sphere is approximately 78 point, oh, I don't know, we just got to pick one of them, I suppose. How about 78.87?